and U.S. and Israeli collaboration, the last uh, session of our teaching on, in Pal on Palestine, colonialism, racism, and justice. Um, we have a great panel today. Um, Aaron Avrati, the executive director for the researching the American-Israeli Alliance. Laura Whitehorn, former U.S. held political prisoner. Um, Sagiv Galai from Jewish Voices for Peace. Um, and Kali and Shariana can't make it. And we're going to have uh, Puri Peterson-Smith from uh, Black for Palestine. Has um, first, we have an announcement in a short video. Ross? Yes. Well, we're, we're honored and, and delighted. We have a message from Palestine, a message from um, some great leaders, local leaders from the Dahesha Re refugee camp. Those of us, there are a few of us in the room who went on a delegation of the Interfaith Peace Builders um, to Palestine and just got back. Um, and among the people we met in the Dahisha refugee camp were Murad and Naji and Suhair. I stayed in their house. And they're from an organization called LELAC, the Palestinian Youth Action Center for Community Development. And of course, Naji and Murad, like so many Palestinian families, are former political prisoners. So they'll speak to us briefly. Can you turn off the lights, please? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's a sign of Hi everyone, I am Suhair from Laylac uh, Association and from Deja Khan. I am as an uh, activist uh, in Laylac uh, with the uh, women. Uh, hi Cameron, uh, my name is Naji. I am director of uh, Laylac Grassroots Organization. I work with youth like political and social activists. Hello uh, everyone, uh, I am Ma'an, I am also a volunteer here and a professional side of uh, the Palestinian yeah, I work with the young people because uh, I know how much they are uh, doing here in our society. They don't have a lot of uh, things to do, just only, you know, uh, uh, they can find themselves in this organization. Now, for that, they can to express themselves and to learn and to think more about their life and how to continue and to survive their daily life in this kind of hard condition. Uh, uh, the main thing is that we, uh, we will focus on this, uh, in this interview or this talk that there is uh, more than 6,500 political prisoners in jail, maybe we will focus on, which is the mirror of the, what's going on and what's happening in Palestine in the ground. Those people uh, are uh, suffering daily life now for that. This is, uh, many families, they're suffering, and many children, many youth people, many all people suffering, everybody in jail. Now we're trying to talk about that and to explain exactly what's happened in this time by the younger side and all what's happening now. This uh, evening that with the prisoner, there is a woman and children and they suffering as a, uh, as a man. But uh, I will speak about uh, the special or basic needs for women and children in the prison. Uh, in the prison. But uh, the, the Israeli occupation never, never uh, care about uh, their special needs as uh, women and children uh, in the jail. And they also they survive and they struggle uh, for their basic needs. But no one uh, cares. So. We, we have some uh, uh, action or uh, uh, some uh, uh, solidarity for women in the jail and the children uh, in the same time for the hunger strike. And also maybe um, a bit about the hunger strike. This is not uh, the only or last or first hunger strike. It's one of many um, hunger strikes. But it was led by a political leader in one of the political parties in Palestine, uh, Mawan Barabuthi. And uh, that gave it a little bit more echo uh, in, in the international service as well. But um, I think it's important to know that uh, the hunger strike has started the hunger strike for a very just reason. And that's to ask for their basic needs as human beings and as prisoners. Uh, for instance, uh, good food, good quality food that is not spoiled and that is not expired, um, a normal human treatment. Uh, from the prisoners, uh, from the from the forces and Israeli forces in prison, uh, and also any sort of form of representation, uh, any um, connection with the outside, with their families, visits, 
uh, normal visits and also it goes deeper to administrative detention and asking for trial and asking for a reason to simple questions like why did you arrest me and, um, and so this hunger strike was uh, launched and uh, more than 1500 prisoners joined the hunger strike for 41 days and uh, this hunger strike was um, to call for these needs and to uh, ask in a strong way and in the meantime it's the most simple way of resisting which is just preventing yourself from eating um, and, and that, that would hopefully put pressure on the Israeli forces to call and respond to the needs uh, of these uh, hunger strikers and um, they would during the hunger strike go through uh, so many uh, violations even while they're hungry and while they're uh, they're not eating, like transforming, tra transforming them from a prison to another uh, in a way to put more exhaustion on them, to make them stand in the sun, uh, taking away the salt, which would, would water be the only thing that could keep your body from surviving uh, in a biological way. And also, for instance, separating them in different cells and isolating them from the outside world so that there wouldn't be a collective decision that would come out of the, of the cells and come out of this political uh, movement inside of the jails that is, as uh, Naji said, a mirror, a representation, a representation of what happens on the outside of the prison, that is on the extreme level of what happens in the inside of the, of the, of the prison. But when we speak about the law, like everybody have a right to the strike, and they use this tool because there is no way of trying by letter, by uh, Center for the Human Rights Organization, the government, whatever, but they, nobody give attention for that from the official dimension now for that. The people they using their stomach because they want to have a like, better life for them in order to survive and to continue their life. And the Israelis, they don't accept even the right for the people to use their stomach for hunger strike. They create a new law during the hunger strike, which is have a right, the Israeli officially have a right now to force the younger striker, I mean to buy a sender, because the sender had sometimes exploring to the wrong side, and we have experience in Palestine there are three uh, prisoners killed by this way, uh, because you know they feed them by force in, in the other side. Now the problem is, uh, we, we deal with the occupation and the colonialism, they don't care about human rights at all, and it's covered by the international, uh, international support, which is not fair. I mean, the people they try to make better life by this way, and for that we try even to speak with the, with the young people about about that because for us it's a new experience. It's not the first one, and not the last one. It's our struggle, and it's kind of struggling to against the occupation. I think uh, there is hundreds of uh, injured of uh, young that they uh, just support the prisoner in a peace way but it doesn't exist with the Israeli soldiers uh, occupation. Yes, and uh, like going off of that, it's that any form of resistance, even this war, is always blocked by, by violence and by the force uh, of the Israeli occupation, which is one face of the colonial uh, side of, of the Israeli society. Uh, but, uh, back to Sorry, we're gonna stop this because there's a no, another shorter one. I'm gonna put it up. I think it's this one. Now. Hi everyone, I am Suhair from like. And I think there is nothing that describes this hunger strike better than the leaders of the hun hunger strike themselves, and this is how they put it. And he said, hunger striking is the most peaceful form of resistance available. It inflicts pain solely on those who participate and on their loved ones, in the hopes that their empty stomachs and their sacrifice will help the message resonate beyond the confines of their dark cells. Their solidarity exposes Israel's moral and political failure. Rights are not bestowed by an oppressor. Freedom and dignity are universal rights that are inherent in humanity to be enjoyed by every nation and all human beings. Palestinians will not be an exception. Only ending occupation will end this injustice and mark the birth of peace. Thank you. Thank you and thank you.
thanks again for coming, everyone. Uh, Sagi is our next speaker, but I forgot to ask if there's anybody who works in or for law enforcement. I just kindly ask that you identify yourself uh, before we continue. <laughs> Now that we're all safe. <laughs> um, hi everyone. Um, I know it's hard to sort of transition from the bed from a video. Yeah, from, from a video that is so um, impactful and visceral um, out of the occupied territories to our privileged and safe environment here, whether or not we're being spied upon. Um, We'll do that. So, my name is Sagib Golan. I was born and raised in Israel. Um, I grew up in a settlement. Um, I moved to Queens, New York when I was 12 years old. Um, and I only mention that, one, as kind of a disclosure about my role in the movement, the BDS movement, and as a member of Jewish Peace, Peace, as well as um, my conception of the hierarchy that's established by the occupation. I think it's obviously. Uh, so talk well. Sure, sure. People in the back hear me? Maybe if you can stand yeah. it's better, actually. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now we're all exhausted. Um, so I grew up in a settlement. And I really, I don't have much to say about that, except that I had a really easy, simple, brilliant childhood. And that's something to contend with at this point when we talk about this battle. Because that was a part of the privilege that was established for me by the occupation. Right? My Israeli passport carried with it the privilege to move freely, to see the ocean, which was based on the criminalization of Palestinian bodies. Like, as noted in <clears throat> their reflection on the prisoners' hunger strike. And that's the place from which I'm coming to today. Um, so today, in the Trump era, we're witnessing a resurgence of activism. And we're all trying to figure out what is our best role, where to plug in. Um, as a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, um, I can say that we've had a very sober understanding of our role as mostly a Jewish American organization. But this campaign of ours, Deadly Exchange, which is the, panel of the, the title of the panel today, comes out of a recognition that merges our privilege and our responsibility. We spent a really long time in our solidarity work dispelling the illustrious notion that criticizing Israel, that fighting the occupation, that joining BDS is anti-Semitic. It's not. I think we're all on the same page here, and it's cool, we can move on. <laughs> but that the exchange campaign is a little different. It's a sort of unorthodox BDS campaign. It simultaneously concerns itself with the safety and dignity of Palestinians, as well as the targeted communities in America. At the core of the campaign is a firm belief that, the safety, that, that safety is not inextricable from policing, and that policing today is seemingly inextricable from violence, racism, and state repression. So what's the target and the goal of the deadly exchange campaign? Since 9-11, Several high-profile, well-connected Jewish organizations like APAC, the Anti-Defamation League, and the Jewish Institute for National Security in America <clears throat> have sought to provide a service to American cities and local police <clears throat> forces, as well as ICE agents and, Navy, and the Navy and Marshals. <clears throat> they bring together security personnel from the FBI and police and ICE with the IDF, the Israeli security guard, the Israeli border guard, and Israeli police, as w and also the Shin Bet, the intelligence, intelligence arm. And together they teach them about Israel's innovation and counterterrorism field. Many of us know that that security that Israel proclaims is pursued through a system of military occupation that's made a routine out of human rights violations. So what is the American police personnel trying to gain and bring back home? I think that the answer to this is revealed by three examples. One is the Islamophobic surveillance and profiling that's been practiced in NYC 
<clears throat> by the NYPD, which was designed by one named Thomas Galati, who's our current chief of intelligence in the NYPD. Thomas Galati <clears throat> has been honored by the Anti-Defamation League and has attended numerous conferences mm -hmm. in which precisely these skills and these <clears throat> teachings about the, oh, he's, he's the chief of intelligence in the NYPD. Um, and he's, he's attended many of these exchange programs where the ADL, or the Jewish Institute for National Security in America, sends security personnel, like the NYPD, to Israel to train and learn from the IDF and from the Shin Bet. And he's innovated this very racist, Islamophobic surveillance system that has not once yielded a result that someone could say stopped an act of terrorism. But it has alienated an entire population in our city. Two other examples um, are Ferguson and Baltimore, both of which, especially, um, I remember his name, <clears throat> uh, Timothy Fitch, which is the, the police chief of Baltimore, also attended these conferences. And the resistance that we saw in the last three years in both of these cities, we've seen an indication that the style of policing learned and adapted and innovated by Israel brought over by the security personnel is not working. And it's based on a dehumanization of another part of society. So, in our campaign in Deadly Exchange, we're not saying that Israel has engendered racist policing or Islamophobia. That would be a big feat. But we are calling on these organizations like Jinsa and DADL to stop the Deadly Exchange because we know it's providing for a style of policing that prioritizes the safety of a segment of society over the rest, which is precisely what I unknowingly experienced as an Israeli growing up in Selma. In the name of law and order, national security, and counterterrorism, these Jewish organizations have sought to provide a service for local police departments that is prioritizing the safety of some over the other. But the arc of this campaign is for us to come together in this Trump era and try to reimagine, despite all odds, what safety could really look like and what security would mean if we didn't have to prioritize the safety of some over the safety of others. Um, my we talk about all this in the Q&A, but my kind of closing remark is that there's, many of you probably know that there's been a lot of conversation, and I think Ron will touch on this, about the role that the occupation plays in the occupied Palestinian territories as a lab for testing weapons. I think a part of this deadly exchange campaign is to also get us to understand that beyond a lab for weapons, it's also become a classroom or a conference place for people to adapt and learn styles of business. about everything after. <laughs> hey. Hey. Okay. Good afternoon. How are you? Just a split to the right. How are you? Good. Yeah? Really? Are you good? <laughs> Sounds all quiet here. Are you tired? It's a long day. It's a long day talking about important okay. stuff, but this stuff are really important, I swear to God. And I know everything is really important, I know this conference is really important, and this panel is incredibly important. But we're going to talk about a few things, like Sagif said, that impact not only the life of millions of Palestinians daily, but your life. And the life of your kids, and your family members, and friends. In the next protest they will attend in their college or with SJP. In the next protest they will have against the president. In the next protest they will have against the imperialist American inspiration across the Middle East. It will affect you and affect them because they will experience, like Sagib just said, tactics of an occupying army on you, on American citizens. And you need to understand that, and I know that most of you already are, to understand how deep it goes and how it doesn't stop only with uh, the local police departments or uh, FBI or CIA. But again, all the way down to local members of your community that you need to understand that are not working with you, but actually working against you. And in the prisons. 
Excuse me? And in our prisons. And in your prisons. Yes, absolutely right. So my name is Irani Frati, and I am the director of RIA, the researching the American-Israeli Alliance. This initiative came in out from the Israel Committee Against House Demolition USA that I directed for the last two years until now. Uh, in the last 10 years, I'm also from Israel. I'm a Jerusalemite. I'm a seven-generation seven Jerusalemite. Uh, and in the last 10 years, I'm researching the Israeli military, the American military and police units, and their collaboration. And I want to give you a glimpse of what we're really talking about when we're talking about deadly exchanges. And we're really talking about the joint training of police. So the types of trainings are always the same, right? They're always called the same. Can you see the screen? Can I see the screen? Yeah. So the types of the trainings are always called the same. They're anti-terror, right? And started just a few months after 9-11. A few months after 9-11, in the beginning of 2002, there's already a delegation of police officers, of ICE officers, of people from across your uh, security field going down to Palestine, Israel to train with the Israeli army. But they're not actually just training with the Israeli army. They're training with a bunch of other people on the ground. I'm going to touch it for a second. What they're actually doing after going there under the assumption of anti-terror is really crowd control during protests and riots. Civilian tactics, weapons and technology cooperation, educational, uh, intelligence experience, and uh, 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 exchanges, inter in, 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 sorry, infrastructure <laughs> security, uh, balancing anti-crime and anti-terror efforts, immigration, all of this stuff are being pushed to one week or two weeks of intense studies in this lab in Palestine. Going to checkpoint 300 in Bethlehem, or going to the Alat Egypt border, or going to the border with Ramallah, or to the weekly protest against of the popular committees in the in the towns of Bilin and Yalin, in Abi Salah. They're moving around, seeing how the Israeli army, as an occupying army, is suppressing nonviolent protests on the borders and doing it to learn how to go back home and suppress protests here. So sponsors, uh, you can see it's, div it's divided between Jewish and organizations like Sagiv mentioned, like Jinsa and GADL and APAC, but actually go around to many others across the states. And this is just a glimpse. There's many more sponsoring this kind of initiatives. Now, the American police, we should say, is not doing it only with Israel. NYPD have dozens of branches across the world in, South, in Latin America since the 60s, and in Africa, and in Asia. But Israel is a special uh, place, because Israel does have a model of security that is being sold around the world. There's a class of understanding that what we can do, you can do. But what we do as Israelis on occupying land to occupy people shouldn't work here on civilians. But it does, and for a long time now. I, we, we can go back later, but I want to I use my seven minutes. Can I just say, um, it's, everything is live streamed, and actually we will be able ooh. to have the whole video. Are we live streaming? Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Go back and watch. Yeah. All of them. So they should pay attention, because this is what we know. <laughs> um, <laughs> funding. So the funding is from many different sources. The ADL is in 501c3 nonprofit, so they're receiving money from donation. They are getting a status of nonprofit in this country to send police training uh, with military units. But it's not only that. There's private corporations. There's federal grants of the Department of Justice or Homeland Security. All of this money is being funneled through this organization to send your police department, your local police department, into Israel to train. This is just a list that we compile. We compile a database of something like 192 departments. Now it's already more than 200 local police departments from your towns and your cities that went in the last 15 years to Israel to train local police. We have names and we have dates. And what we're creating in Raya is this database working with local communities to start already doing local BDS campaign against city halls, against nonprofits in their towns, and against the police departments in New York cities. And try to understand what it means and to stop it. We're already working in New York, in Chicago, in Oakland, in LA. We already have people that work across the country. But it's very, very important that you will spread the information 
Because the deadly exchange campaign is not only around Jewish organization. This is the niche of JVP, and it's a very important niche. It's important that Jewish people in this country will say this is not our job and this is not in our name. But it's also important to understand that this problem is not a Jewish problem. It's a security problem that we are all experienced for the last 30 years. Um, other agencies that are participating, I promise you that, not only ICE, the Immigration uh, and Customs Border, but and not only the FBI and police, but also MTA employees that are already there in the first trip in 2002, Port Authority. There's tons of different uh, 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 agencies that are going down to Israel, not only sheriff departments, but transit authorities, Air Force, US Marine, FEMA, all of them are being trained to, an, um, to emergencies. The fire department, all of these agencies are going there to train in an occupying army. Why would the hell would the MTA employees need to work with an occupying army on occupying land, on occupied people, to understand how to control people on a subway ride in the morning between Brooklyn and Manhattan? So some of the work that we're doing in RIA is also tracking all of the surplus military uh, gear, the 1033 program, of uh, uh, the Justice Department and, and Security Service of the United States on the people and on police departments. So police departments, in local police departments in your cities and your towns now are holding equipment, some refined by Israel, some bought from Israel, some sold to Israel and other countries after tried here in, cer in certain cities. You have drones and armored vehicles and full body gear. And like Sagif said, we saw that in Ferguson, we saw that in Baltimore, we've seen it in Oakland and in New York your police gradually look more and more like an army. And that means that you are gradually becoming not only, of course, people of color that are in this country being occupied for 200 years, but everybody in this country are becoming the subject of a military control and a military occupation. Um, and just to finish, that was the police part of it. But the police part of it is going hand in hand with the military training. The military training is there for years and years since the beginning of the State of Israel, even just before. There's already weapons uh, exchange, military programs that are being exchanged and help to the Israeli military. So when we're talking about the Israeli-American military industrial complex, it's important to understand what happened before President Trump took office. Under President Obama, in last September, in September, you remember the American uh, president signed with Netanyahu government the biggest military aid ever, happening to $3.8 billion a year of military aid, and $38 billion altogether for the next 10 years. Now, as we try to understand this uh, military aid, we want you to think about it not as a gift, or not just as a help for Israel to occupy the Palestinians, but as an investment that is coming back. Because what nobody told us when this uh, deal was signed in September is that from $38 billion, 100% of the military aid will have to come back to the US to buy equipment and technology from American companies, from Lockheed Martin and other companies here from Boeing. So in the last 2007 to 2018, we had a situation when 74% of the military aid had to come back to the US and Israel had to buy equipment and technology from Americans. But we still had Israel, that means 26%, 26.4% to play with. And this is how Israel built their own uh, military industries in Israel. But now the latest military deal is going all the way to 100%. And we can talk about why it happened and how Israel became a bigger player in the weapon, ex weapon exists world and weapon ex exchange world and arm trading around the world and how Israel pushed in 2012 the America from a huge deal in India where India is the biggest buyer of weapons in the world and Israel just became their main supplier of weapons instead of the US. There's a lot of reason of why the US is taking back control. But what it's really important to understand is this money is not a gift that you gave to us. This money is actually invested in your military industrial complex, not ours. And the occupation of Palestinians starts here, mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. And if you want to stop what's happening there in Palestine and to defend your rights to continue to be as free as you can be and not occupied, that starts here. Not at protests there and not just protesting the Israeli government on embassy, and that's important. 
but protesting the American government and protesting your local town police, your city department police, your college police that are also participating in this stuff. Because they already figured it out years ago and they're organizing together to oppress us. And we need to stop thinking about there and here and start thinking about this one thing that is going on and start organizing together to resist them. So I hope you join the campaign of the Deadly Exchanges and spread the word and thank you so much for your time. So I'll try to talk last. Uh, my name is Laura Whitehorn. Um, I'm a former political prisoner and also was part of a wonderful delegation that Rabab organized um, last year of prisons and prison activists to Palestine. And I want to start with a couple of things. First, to go back to the hunger strike. I think maybe it was said in a, in a previous workshop, but I think we should celebrate that the hunger strike was successfully concluded. Yes. And then not only did the prisoners win uh, their demands, and they won a recognition of their unity. They unified prisoners representing every part of the Palestinian movement. This is tremendously important and showed the impact that can be had when the people inside the prisons are acting in concert with the people outside. So I wanted to say that. Second, I want to say that we are on Native American land and Manhattan, right? And um, that there are very few places in the United States, certainly in the Northeast, um, the South, and the, and the uh, all over the country, that you can be where you're not on Native American land. And the reason I want to say that isn't just to say, okay, we have to, is to remind ourselves that the reason why this is true, why the military and the police are one between Israel and the United States, is because we are also a white settler colony here. So what Segev said about your privilege that you're, is the same as mine, um, but, and that's one part of it for being um, white in this country. The other part that I believe ha is sort of more um, future looking is that our liberation is is wrapped up together because we are not free when we are free at other people's expense. So um, I joke sometimes the only time I identify myself as Jewish, not because I'm ashamed of it, but because it's not that important to my political identity is when I'm talking about Palestine because I do want to make it clear that there are Jews who, that, that helps to, to deflate the uh, anti-Semitism bullshit. Um, the, you know, look at, at the, the outline of the police uh, agencies and the connections made me think about COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence yes. program, and about the LEAA, remember that, the Law Enforcement yeah. Assistance Association, whatever it was. Um, and about the, the days when the police became militarized, when police, when if you would go into a housing project in the Bronx or in Harlem, the social services were being run by the police because there was an understanding on the part of the government, that of the United States, that to suppress and destroy movements for national liberation within the United States and in the 60s and 70s, that really did mean the black liberation movement, the Native American movement, the Chicano-Mexicano movement. Um, what am I leaving out? I know I'm leaving something out. Well, no, and the, that was the goal, and it still is. And so the police agencies and the cooperation of the Zionist State of Israel began probably in 1948. I mean, I think we should really be tracing back to the 1948 and not just if people are talking about the occupation and we're talking about 67, I think we have to talk about the fact that Israel is a settler colony and it was settled by force and that Palestinians were thrown out of their land and that um, the state that was created is not a democratic state and all the things that we have to keep saying. There's, I don't know if people saw, there's some op-ed in the Times this morning that made my blood boil um, about what is it, Israel never gets to say I'm sorry or something, I can't remember what the culture is, but it basically starts with the, with the myth that Israel um, was a legitimate state or is a legitimate state. And so I think we have to always go back to that, just as in the United States, we have to go back to the fact that 
black people in the United States were, as Malcolm X said, born in prison, born in slavery, and that what we have is a system of repression, not just racism, not just discrimination, but of national oppression. And so, I don't know, how am I doing on time? I have no idea. So I think I'm supposed to also talk about abolition, right, prisons? <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, I'm formerly incarcerated. I met a few other formerly incarcerated people. Um, I started a group called Release Agent People in Prison, RAP. Um, the head of the group is a man named Jahid Farid, who did 33 years in New York State prisons on a 15 to life sentence. And our main struggle, we talk about aging people in prison and about elders, because when you talk about long-termers, people glaze over, you know, and we're trying to get people to understand that the people who are in prison are us and our neighbors and, um, and that we have a responsibility to one another and also that we could have a different system. When people, when I talk about abolition to some of my friends, they, they get nervous. And I know I and a lot of other people who are in prison, the whole idea of just open up the gates and let everyone out is not a very attractive um, proposition because some of the people that we were in need some kind of uh, rehabilitation control, uh, you know, treatment, but not prisons. So the point of abolition isn't to just to get rid of one system, it's to replace it with another. And, you know, I think the most the most stirring speech I ever heard about uh, abolition was when Angela Davis talked about it and talked about the abolitionist movement against slavery. But we should be very clear, what, what replaced slavery, unfortunately, wasn't black reconstruction because it was overthrown within you know, a very short period of time, but was Jim Crow and was uh, eventually uh, mass incarceration. So when we talk about abolition, we have to be really careful. And just because I only have a few minutes, what I want to say about it, is that we cannot abolish prisons or the police or anything else in and by itself. And that, um, what was the phrase that you used for about the, uh, the indivisibility of justice. liberation? Justice. Of justice. Well, there is also an indivisibility of the state, violent, the violent state apparatus. And it isn't just the things that we see up close. It isn't just the police. It's also the corporations and everything behind the state. It's just that they get to look pacific because it's the police and the yep. prisons who do the dirty work for them. So when we are looking at the military and the police connection to Zionism, between Zionism and US imperialism, we have to be clear that we're not talking about institutions that can be reformed or changed through you know, deals between the de Blasio administration and the police or whatever, and that there was a reason why we in the 60s, people, the Black Panthers, talked about an occupying army of the police and talked about community control. So um, let's let, I guess that is basically what I want to say. I will say that when we went on our trip, I'm already really uh, busy with work on um, political prisoners, supporting political prisoners and uh, decarceration. And I should say rap, which sounds like the most sort of namby-pamby, oh, let's get all people out of prison. We consider ourselves an abolitionist project because what we're aiming at is two things. And one is the role of the police in, um, in continuing to imprison uh, resistant communities, the black community, the brown community, the communities that are the threat to make revolution and have been. And that's what the 60s and 70s were about. And that's why when you hear about COINTELPRO, it's not an exaggeration because they really did see the threat that would, that would happen if people took the country back. Um, so we point to the permanent punishment, how uh, the long sentences that came in, came in after the 70s, that it's not an accident that what we call mass incarceration followed the counterintelligence program. So we, we talk about that. And the other thing is about political prisoners. Okay, in this country, there are many fewer political prisoners than, in, than Palestinian political prisoners in Zionist jails. And they're scattered around the country. But they have been in prison, some of them, for 50 years. And you know, people talk about the Black Panther Party. There are 20 people who were members of the Black Panther Party who are still in prison. Three of them are within a couple of hours' drive of this, of this school. They're in upstate New York. Herman Bell, Jaleel Muntakim, Robert Seth Hayes, and there's also David Gilbert, 
who is a white anti-imperialist and was part of solidarity with the black struggle. So why is supporting those people important and why is becoming involved in the struggle to free them important? And I don't know how many people were at the uh, plenary last night, but Sekou Odinga, who was also a member of the Black Panther Party, spoke last night. Getting him on a panel, on, the, on a plenary, in this conference, has taken, what, Susie, 12 years, 10 years? We started arguing in, in, right, in, that there should be a speaker on political prisoners and prisons, that the left around the world, every left uh, worth its whatever, um, <laughs> it demands the freedom of political prisoners, except in the United States. And when I say that, I should say, because sitting in this room is someone who listened to that call, and her organization does have it on their platform, Free All Political Prisoners, which is um, Emily Yamasaki from the Freedom Socialist Party. But no other organization in the left took that up when we started saying it. And it's a shame, because if you're going to be in the left, you can have to go up against the state. You can't, like... What are, what are you fighting for? Are you fighting for a peace, you know, peaceful coexistence with capitalism? Are you fighting for uh, white people and maybe academics, you know, or people who are in a certain class to be able to be free in this society and still have uh, no black people be allowed to be able to live in New York City anymore because gentrification is on. I mean, we have to look at the fundamental thing that we're talking about and fighting for. So, I don't know, when I came back from Palestine, I felt I saw the United States even more clearly. And um, I saw it in the way that I first saw it when I was organized by the Black Panthers in 1968, which was as a settler colony that is in and of itself a human rights violation and must be totally transformed, abolished, and replaced. So, that's it. that came out of our trip. Yes. And uh, we don't have free. very many of them. <laughs> not free. They're not free. No, how much are they? I don't, I, I, Minimum five dollars. Five dollars. Anyway, it's called For Love of Palestine, and they're um, it's women, prisoners in Palestine, political prisoners in the United States. Uh, so afterwards, thank you. Okay. Well, um, I feel like uh, the luckiest panelist in the world because everybody already did the heavy lifting <laughs> of the big things. Um, I want to talk about, I really want to, to talk about, um, well, what I want to get to is the, the panel's talked think, brilliantly and in, in great detail about these different forms of collaboration between our enemies, between the people who run this country, the people who run Israel. And what I'd like to talk about is the other side of that, um, how ordinary people kind of understand that and come into a sense of solidarity with one another and awareness of the structures that we're up against. But I, I want to start by um, talking about, uh, I don't know, a, a sort of what funhouse mirror image of solidarity, which is the, the unity that our enemies have. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the kind of collaboration that you've documented shows that, they, I mean, if we think that, you know, we, we have our left forum, they have, left, <laughs> they have forums all the time, all over the place, to talk, to collaborate on how to oppress us. It's not coincidence <laughs> that um, the, the, the tactics that we see in the streets of the United States are the same ones that we see uh, implemented in Palestine. It's been, it's been uh, uh, documented and talked about um, on this panel. And, and, and so countries like, yes, Israel and the United States, but also Canada, South Africa, Australia, are quite self-conscious of the fact that they are all one together. They have their particular project, but they also are in a general project um, uh, of you know, for power and colonization and settlement and, and imperialism. Um, so that's them. They're quite united. They make the connections all the time. Whenever, it's funny, I'm sure, sure many of you have had the experience of going into a room and bring up house things like, wow, don't bring that up. <laughs> what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, our enemies are happy and free to make those connections, so we should be as well, right? Um, if they can identify with themselves, then we should identify with each other on the bottom of society as well. 
So with that, I want to tell a story. I, I, um, I'm, uh, I co-authored the um, 2015 uh, Black Statement of Solidarity with, with Palestine. And I want to just... Um, I want to say uh, a word about how it came together. It actually it was published in 2015, but it actually began in 2014, which was, um, I'm sure we all remember, 2014 was, was a wild summer in the world and in this country. It was the summer when Israel was launching its latest one-sided assault on Gaza. Um, and, of course, there's been countless uh, episodes of Israeli violence against Palestinians, but that... That set of operations in particular will always stand out to me um, as a summer of slaughtered children, as Israel slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian children in Gaza. Well, that same summer, of course, was the summer of the Ferguson uprising. And so, and when Ferguson rose up, there were not one but two statements of solidarity from Palestine to the black population, to the rebels of Ferguson, uh, uh, here in the United States. And um, I, I uh, connected with uh, an activist who some of you have the, the privilege of knowing, named Christian Davis Bailey, um, somebody who had written in Ebony Magazine and elsewhere about why black people need to stand with Palestine. And the two of us started collaborating. So we said, OK, we've seen statements from Palestinians in solidarity of the black struggle here, and we need to send something in the other direction. Uh, solidarity among black people in this country uh, to Palestine. And so we started working on this statement, um, and then we got swept up in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and and, and it, the, the statement got shelved and ended up being published a year later on the anniversary of the Israeli attack on Gaza. And it ended up being fortuitous that it actually took a year because in that year's time was not only an incredible kind of moment in the long uh, history of black struggle in this country, but it was also a new moment for black Palestine solidarity. I'm sure folks in this room know that there were Palestinians on the ground in Ferguson as part of the uprising, that there were more delegations uh, uh, to Palestine um, from black Americans, more delegations of Palestinians uh, here, and, and some of which were particularly focused on connecting with black activists in the United States. And so there had been a certain foundation laid for this kind of solidarity, this, this more recent moment of solidarity by people like Angela Davis, Cornell West, Alice Walker, prominent black uh, activists who've been speaking for quite a while on the question of Palestine. And things really came together in 2014. Um, and then uh, we, we issued this statement in 2015. And there were, of course, all of these, um, you know, I mean, Aaron was able to show us what was happening behind the scenes between law enforcement in this country and uh, the Israeli state. But the, the activities that they carry out every day produce this reality that just visually is so familiar. I mean, if you're familiar with black oppression in this country, you look over and see what's happening in Palestine, it just looks so familiar. I mean, we have, for example, in both cases, been inundated um, since 2014 with countless hours of cell phone footage of the police brutalizing and murdering black people on the streets of the United States. And people, I'm sure, just saw this past week footage, cell phone footage of Palestinian uh, young women uh, being killed by Israeli settlers and by um, Israeli security forces. Um, there is, uh, so, so there's the kind of police tactics. There's mass incarceration. I mean, I, I don't have to tell the people in this room what the, the impact of mass incarceration is on the black population here. I mean, every black person in this country who I know has some family member who's either currently incarcerated or has been incarcerated. And when folks hear about the reality of mass incarceration, incarceration in Palestine, there's something familiar there. Um, also, I will say that during the 2014 attack on Gaza, there was this particularly despicable thing that happened where as Israel was bombing Gaza, Israelis in, in, in the south gathered in their lawn chairs to watch the spectacle of Gaza being bombed. And it called to mind the, public spe the, the spectacles of public racist violence in this country against black people in the form of lynching uh, and so on. So there are so many different connections. And once again, if our enemies can make the connections, then we can as well. So um, what I want to, I want to, um, it's funny, I was, I was thinking about talking about some of the, the foundations of U.S. and Israeli society. And I thought, uh, some, some deep shit by Dan Laura's went ahead and <laughs> paved the way, so I'm going to keep keep going on that, on, that, on that path, because truthfully, racist incarceration and racist police violence are expressions of a project that has always been fundamentally a racist settler project. 
in this country and similarly in Palestine. Um, and similarly, I, I also want to talk about the question of abolition because there is any number of reforms that we need to pay for when it comes to the way that policing is carried out in this country and in terms of incarcerated. But fundamentally, racism cannot be reformed out of policing in this country, nor can it be reformed out of incarceration. There will not be a criminal justice system in the United States that is not racist. There are struggles to be waged against it, but at the end of the day, the system itself must go. And I agree, that means not just abolishing incarceration, but that can only take place in the context of fundamentally restructuring this entire society. Um, that's what's necessary for black liberation, for the liberation of all uh, oppressed people in this country. And similarly, in, in, in Palestine, there's not going to be some kind of Israeli state that respects Palestinian human rights. Palestinian e equality is incompatible with the Zionist project. So we're talking about the restructuring, the, the, the social transformation um, of those places. So I just want to end on the, the point where Ab said, make sure you tell people what to do, um, what people <laughs> actually do. And of course, um, we have to continue to call attention to Israeli violence in Palestine. Um, of course, uh, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, but also, of course, when they do these, these very um, visible public kind of military operations. But it's also critical for everybody here, and I know this won't be controversial, to go to a Black Lives Matter rally when the cops kill uh, somebody where you live here. Because, again, we're talking about the same systems. And it's important to, again, be there in solidarity in a struggle against anti-black racism with what you know about the oppression of Palestinians. Because that, that knowledge actually enriches a sense of what's really a global, a global structure. I mean, what we're seeing the NYPD carry out in the day-to-day, -day in the neighborhoods of the city, they're the kind of foot soldiers carrying out what's actually a global project, a global system. And whether people in this country know it or not, our fates are bound up with Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, and so those of us who already know that need to, know that, need to bring uh, uh, that knowledge into what is, you know, this is unfortunately kind of a nightmarish moment in, you know, a generally fucked up country. Um, but there are new waves of resistance. People who've never been to protest before are deciding, I need to be an activist. I, I don't know what the statistic is at the moment, but I know going into last school year, one in 10 co entering freshmen in college said that they plan on attending a protest. And the number of black incoming freshmen was, was a higher proportion. So it's exciting that new waves of people are getting political. And those of us who have some knowledge of what this country and its allies like Israel have done historically and are doing in collaboration today need to bring that knowledge into the fights that are happening at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to have some time for questions. Um, but before that, I want to thank our panelists again and thank uh, Dr. Rabab Abduhadi for organizing this great series of panels. And I'm wondering if, Rabab, you would like to say it here as well? This is the program of doing token uh, faculty member. I just want to say a few things about uh, the, the prisoner issue because with, with our delegation, uh, one is that I want to just say that we are, I want to give a shout out. And Sharyana Ferrer was supposed to be with us. And Sharyana is uh, one of the co organizers of the UPI for Oscar, which was the University of Puerto Rico, the UPI Gas Campus, solidarity with Oscar Lopez Rivera. Mm -hmm. And she cannot, because she had to fly back to Puerto Rico. She was here last night at the Berkshire Forum and she spoke. But she had to. Oscar Lopez has been free. He's going to be next week on Thursday at the Hostos Community College. So I think everybody should try to go and celebrate. And Oscar Lopez, despite extreme pressure on him and on the campaign of Puerto Rican prisoners to not talk about Palestine, especially coming from somebody like Melissa Beverito, Zionist here, and some of you in New York know that. Actually, when, when he went to Chicago, he stood up with Sarsmiya Ode, the former Palestinian prisoner, mm -hmm. and they reaffirmed their solidarity with each other and so on. So that's one of the, 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 the other aspect of the uh, Laura, I think Laura and Uli, you mentioned the whole question of prisoner 
and so on, and I really thank you for the history, because if we go back to, and this is another topic of black Palestinian solidarity, this, we have plenty of work to do on government, like bring it on, but it does go back to Robert uh, uh, Williams and the Negroes with guns, and he was, uh, he was a snake and uh, Malcolm X, so there's a lot of history that people don't think, don't know and don't think about, and we really need to come back to that. But I wanted to say something, and I know you mentioned that like Angela's, Angela Davis is uh, sort of uh, fairly recent and so on. I wanted to say one of the things that we had in the delegation 2011, where we went to Palestine. And the next day of the, of the delegation, we were on, in Nablus at the meeting with all the organizers from Nablus who came, Friday morning, which was really unusual, it was wonderful. And everybody was supposed to introduce themselves. And Angela Davis got up. And she said that I'm, and I'm, I've said this story, some, some of you already know, but some of you don't know. Uh, she said that one of the things that sustained her in prison was a letter she received from Palestinian prisoners who were in prison in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And they sent it out, and that sustained her through 18 months in prison. Nobody knew about it. Like, none of, none of us knew about it. Nobody else knew about it. She would just said it. And then when we went to uh, Jerusalem, to meet with uh, Palestinian uh, uh, council members who were being expelled from Jerusalem by the Israelis. Uh, they had a tent in the International Community of the Red Cross. One of the former prisoners who was the author, one of the authors of the letter, met us, Yaqub Oudi, who actually is in a film called The Ruins of Lifta, and I invite you all to see it. It's really incredible. And he meets a, a Jewish American uh, woman who has a non and she says to him, here's my tattoo. And he says, and this is my tattoo. And he shows her that how his head mm. has been broken from here to the back during interrogation in Israeli prisons. Mm. And this is something kind of like brings all of these two things together, the humanity of people. Mm. We need to actually really work on the question of prisoners and the way things are coming together. The last thing I would just want to say in terms of the prisoner strike, that everybody talks about prisoner strike and everybody talks about the 1,800 or so prisoners. Definitely we have more men prisoners in prison than women prisoners. I'm always asking a question, does it really matter who the gender of the prisoner is or something? It doesn't, it doesn't. It does, it doesn't because prisoners are prisoners. They get tortured, they get, they get brutalized. They all have electro, electronic uh, things attached to their genitals. I mean, there is all the whole, there is of castration. All of this stuff happens to all the prisoners. But also people always claim that Palestinian women and Palestinian gender is kind of like we're completely absent, we're silent, we do not say anything, we are both sides, we only follow our men. Women only participate because the men have sexual prowess that attract the Palestinian women as women more than our women. So I think it's, I mean, this is, it really becomes really important. I was like, this is not what we really want to do, but this is really important for us to bring this up and say, this is actually not the case, okay, not the case. And to uh, bring attention to the, also the, the, what Palestinian women prisoners are going through. And I maybe, Laura, you can speak more about the women prisoners that we've met. But I wanted to just say one thing is that, that on the day the Palestinian prisoners, uh, Marwan Barghouti and the other prisoners are uh, declared there, one of the very well-known Palestinian women prisoners, Lina Jarbouni, was released. She had spent 15 years in prison. It's very interesting about Lina because Lina is a Palestinian from outside Israel. Lena is not one of the people from the West Bank, which means she's not supposed to be subjected to Israeli military. Mm -hmm. uh, she's supposed to be subjected to Israeli police. The women, the people who are get arrested inside the 48 areas that go to the police, the, the people who get arrested in the West Bank go to the military. And Jerusalem is a bit fuzzy, so it depends on the Israeli authorities. They decide whether they want to actually apply the annexation of Jerusalem and the Israeli police, or they want to apply the military and. It's just up to them. They can, I mean, when you have power, you can do whatever you want. So it's kind of like, why do they do it? There is no logic. Power is unpredictable and occupation is unpredictable because they can get out of it. But Lena was, was released the day before, and this has become a very important issue also. When people talk about Palestinian prisoners, people say that 800,000 Palestinian prisoners have been in prison. Actually, 800,000 Palestinian prisoners have been in prison since 67 in the West Bank and Gaza. This is not counting everybody else who has been in prison. This is not counting Palestinians who have been imprisoned by various Arab regimes. Okay, and this is something that's really important. So we just run out of time. We just only have time to <laughs> There's so many issues that need to be. And we hope people will organize more events in different places to do that. But it also brings up the whole question of what happens to Palestinian prisoners inside Israel. Because Israel has historically refused to release 
Palestinian prisoners inside Israel in the various prison deals. But with the Shalit, there was also existed always, always, always Palestinian prisoners. And Yunus was the longest held Palestinian prisoner, actually is from South Israel. It's from the same village as Lina Jalmun. So I think it's really important to think, and there have been many incidents that I think you are a can speak about it because you are witness to talk about women's soldiers. So I think it's really important to also speak about that and think about how do we bring these issues together because also US women prisoners. Laura is an example yeah. right here, living with them. There's so many that have been in prison again and again. Asata Shapur is in Haiti, in Cuba. Uh, we know Marilyn Buckberg in England that have been. And there's a, there's a lot of this stuff that's going on. So I think it's really important to kind of also speak about all these very inhuman aspects of the prisons and talk about them and raise and raise consciousness around that, the whole question of presentation. So I guess we'll open it up to questions. I ask that you ask a question if you can, um, you know, rather than, than a statement. I mean, can we take three and then we'll have a, our panelists? So, so one, two, three. Oh, you said that? Okay, my name is Bobby Singlebaum. I, I, my question is that uh, as far as how the students in the CUNY system and places elsewhere in the universities are being shut down if they are having you know, Palestinian groups, and, and how that needs to be addressed, obviously, and, and, uh, and what kind of actions need to be done because I, you know, that's unacceptable. Thank you. Second. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know how directly this is related to the prisons, but I'm wondering about the organ harvesting, if that happens through that, and then also um, the ISIS yeah. troops, or whatever you want to call them, terrorists, that are being treated in Israeli hospitals on the Golan. Thank you. Yeah, okay, we've been educating ourselves in part of the, the deadly exchange. Remember? We've been educating ourselves about the deadly exchange. So we learned a lot about, okay, so what the NYPD and the police are learning from the Israel. But it's an exchange, and over the years, I've understood that also the Israelis, army and police, learn from the U.S. tactics. But they haven't learned a, a um, as much about that, and I guess I have to educate myself about that. This is the teaching. So, um, can you ex could you maybe talk a little bit about what the idea, what the Israeli army and police have learned from the NYPD and the police? Because I don't think we've done that much education about that, or I maybe I need to learn more about that. That's great. So, no, let's uh, let's go over. Yeah. Let me hear the second question. The second question, could you repeat the yeah, question um, about organ harvesting the and organ harvesting the ISIS troops who are being treated in Israel? Yeah. Thank you. So we can take responses just right across the line. Does anybody from SJP want to talk about yeah. the, the um, Judy free speech issues? Mm. I would just point you to Ali Abu Nima's book, The Battle for Justice in mm. Palestine, which I think more than anything elaborates on the role of private, the kind of like Israeli funded um, think tanks that have aided a lot of this anti free speech litigation against the students and have embroiled them in long standing, certain students embroiled them in long standing legal battles. But on the other hand, sorry, I mean, we also have an incredible organization called um, Palestine Legal. Uh, which is a pioneer of free speech, which um, I think is built around what's identified by the late Michael Radner, who's the head of CCR, um, which there is an exception to free speech in America, which is the Palestine. Can you just announce that there yeah. is, this whole day was a kind of a unity. So we started with the North, which was such an important place on the film and Andy May that everybody needs to know about and see. And we also had a whole session on the campus attacks, and it has been live streamed. 
so just for, I mean, it's impossible for people to be here the whole day unless we're crazy. Some of us are crazy. But can we just let people know how they get access to the live stream if they want to get, you know, see the entire configuration? It's friends, of, friends of Ahmed at Facebook. Friends of Ahmed. And it's on Facebook. We're not streaming. I'll put the link. Once, once we finish, finish. He's, he, Salim, Salim probably shared it on our. Uh, because that's what the teacher has, the plan, the program, and so on. Mm. There is a website. Somebody created a Facebook page. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll put the link in a minute. I'll put the link. Okay, you can put it up there. Yes, I'll come on. Any responses? Well, I just want to say one thing, because I sat, I, I, um, I was in part of the last workshop, which was, is precisely about that question about on the campuses. And I'm just reading a book um, called Black Moon, uh, Black Star Crescent Moon. Mm -hmm. um, really wonderful book mm -hmm. by Sahel. Uh, yeah. And he talks about, reminded me of how the Red Scare was used within the black movement as well as in the broader progressive movement to suppress the national liberation struggles around the world, the, the struggles around the world, the anti-imperialist struggles, and to divide people in this country from those struggles by saying the threat of communism yeah, was yeah. so strong. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some of us here are part of a some of no separate justice. That's something else you can do on Monday from six to seven. Come to uh, Pearl Street, right across from the end of Pearl Street, right across from the Metropolitan Correctional Center. We have a vigil, which is trying to break the silence around um, these cases that you see in the in the newspaper, uh, these supposed cases of terrorism, which are really either totally faked, most of them, or set up by the police. And this is another thing that I think um, that we we should look into and think about is the Mossad and the uh, secret police here. Um, and to take a stand saying that we stand with it, I mean, the name No Separate Justice is a little iffy because it makes it sound as if there is justice for some prisoners, but there's not in the United States. But it is a way of saying we do not go for this. We do not believe it to stand against Islamophobia. So um, that's another thing. But I think that seeing the whole question of repression of, quote, free speech, repression, you know, around the cultivation of free speech for the right wing, um, in, the, in an international context, because one other thing that I think has been really clear in this panel, and especially is clear from Black for Palestine every time I hear someone from that group speak or write, is that internationalism is the key to every struggle for justice. We want to talk about the indivisibility of justice. It lies in internationalism. It lies in not caring more about the people who were killed in Manchester than we do about the people who were killed in Afghanistan and Iraq. It lies in um, being inspired by and led by the struggles for justice in the world that are breaking boundaries that we have yet to break in the United States. So um, I, it's not a specific direct answer about that. Just one last thing on the thing about prisons. Is the one thing that was really interesting to me besides the fact that when, I, when Rabab would introduce us on our on our trip and say that I had been a political prisoner, no one, no one in Palestine had to ask me what that is, which is here, you know, oh, you didn't, you said something that the government didn't like, and I said, well, yeah, but I did something that the government didn't like, and yeah, I knew it was illegal and it was violent, um, but it was it was political and it was against the imperialist uh, regime, and. In Palestine, there was an understanding that political prisoners are not people just who are put in prison for not doing anything or for you know saying something wrong, but people have the right to fight, and that the government um, does not have the right to tell people that it, who are under its foot how they struggle to get the foot off their neck. And the other thing, though, was that um, we were talked to a lot about the conditions and strip searches and all kinds of very humiliating, horrible things that are done in, to Palestinians. And the, the degree is worse. It is a, a more 
frontal form of genocide, I think, than in a lot of the prisons here as a, as a, a but not always, because it reminded me what an outlier the United States is and how when you have a prison system, which is about the, the project of, of um, killing um, the black nation as a whole, that the United States is an outlier in the, quote, civilized world, along with Israel, about how it treats its own um, people when it puts us in prison. Because many of the things that we talked about in Palestine that we've done, they thought we would be, sh they th you know, they looked at our delegation, they knew we were from the United States, a, a Western country, they thought we would be shocked by some of them, and we weren't, because they are de rigueur for the prison system here. Yeah, just a, a couple of um, responses, and I'll, so I'll second the, the point that <clears throat> if you can access um, video of the discussion that we had prior to this one, it was really such a wealth of, of conversation about dealing with questions of repression on, on campus in this country. And um, the one thing I'll, I'll say that, came, that that we talked about in that discussion was that at the moment, not only is there pretty um, incredible uh, intimidation and other forms of repression against students and organizing for Palestine on campus and faculty who speak about Palestine. But actually, the question of free speech on campus in general is one that there needs to be a major struggle about in the United States, where you have on many campuses um, white supremacist posters have appeared, um, uh, and that they, now they're claiming the mantle of free speech, and when um, they come to, to, to give presentations, the same university administrations that outlaw SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, say, well, Neil Yiannopoulos or David Duke have a right to speak, or, or, or whatever. Um, and and it's, it's, there's, there's any number of issues that are connected to that, um, uh, including, um, uh, we mentioned in the, in the last discussion, um, the question of sexual violence on campus, which is also what students are discouraged from saying anything about uh, because the university administrations don't want, don't want an honest conversation about the rampant sexual violence. So, so those of us who are Palestine solidarity activists on campus need to link up, I mean, we need to talk about Palestine. We also need to link up with all these other activists and say, we need to get together and defend, defend free speech in general on our campuses. Um, the, the other thing, just I, don't, I, I can't speak to um, particular sort of uh, trainings that the US conducts um, uh, of, of Israeli um, you know, agents of the Israeli state, um, and, and perhaps others can. But the United, if we're talking about an exchange um, between the US and Israel, the United States is generous in so many ways uh, <laughs> to, to the Israeli state and to really every repressive state all around the world. And just what, the, the United States sets a framework that is the context for militarized repression. In, in the, the latest framework is the war on terror. And when the US launched its so-called war on terror, Israel said, oh, we have a war on terror. Yasser Arafat is our bin Laden. That was the, the phrase that they used. So it's, thank you, USA, for giving us a kind of heading on which to pursue what's actually been a long-term project, um, a new chapter of that. So that's a contribution of, of the United States. Yeah. So, yeah, very quickly. So just maybe to continue this line of thoughts, I, I would encourage you to think about this collaboration a little differently, not as a, uh, not as a, as a dual, you know. Are you going to address my question? I'm not sure, but maybe. Okay. Let's let's wait for a second and see. Um, but I think that you know I, I would encourage you to think about this frame a little differently about this collaboration because the U.S. have collaborations with many states across the world, right? And they they work together. And Israel, the war on terror that Israel conducted was fitting with the war on terror the states began, you know, to replace the war on drugs. It was already there. We were already there. Israel was already there, waiting to fill that spot for Americans across the world. What I do think you should think about when you're thinking about the U.S. training other countries, and there, it is true, what you're saying is true, Israeli officials are here plenty of times, Israeli military, Israeli police officers, different agencies are in the U.S. getting trains from the U.S., and I would encourage you to think about it as more as the U.S. empire around the world yes. and their people yes. working for them. Yes. So the phrase of Israel as the 51 state or the 54th state is a very current one in the Middle East. Israel is in many ways a continuation of the U.S. and the U.S. inspiring to control the region through their people. The model there, in the Dimona uh, uh, site when we have our nuclear power, the U.S. have uh, a radar on it. 
There's U.S. bases, military bases in the middle of Tel Aviv, in the north, in the south. The U.S. is holding uh, weapons uh, storage in different places in Israel that are waiting for them to be used in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation of war that the U.S. has been involved with in the Middle East. In 2014, when Israel attacked Gaza, Israel asked to use some of this ammunition, American ammunition made for Americans to use in the Middle East, because we just ran out of ammunition. We just used everything that we had in one summer, 51 days. So we used the permission, and the United States gave it to us, and we continue using American ammunition uh, in Gaza. So in many ways, the interest of the U.S. in Israel is very much the interest of the U.S. in itself and continue dominating around the world. One more word about the universities that I would say is that two things that I think we don't need to take lightly. First is the, is the fact that campus polices are going to Israel to train. And that's, for me, it's even more insane than, let's say, ICE or, you know, or anyone else, police campuses that should not be armed, should not be using yeah. this kind of tactics, are training with an occupying army. Uh, and the second is the Israel investment, Israeli, the official Israel, Israeli government investment in these colleges. Almost every big university in the United States have what we call shalia, have a member, an Israeli member, ex-military soldier mm -hmm. in the campus running, usually the Hillel, you have a car, you have an apartment, you have a salary. In Columbia University, for example, in research that we did in 2013, we discovered that one of the job description is to raise one million dollar every year for the Hillel. They're combating BDS on campuses. The Israeli government is giving 100 million shekel every year toward that. Uh, inspirations. So we're fighting very big, like we said, forces that are organizing very well against us and against free speech. And at the same time, using free speech the discourse to send military soldiers to sit in campuses and talk about it. Military soldiers that are engaged in apartheid are talking to students in this country. But it's the free speech that being crossed is when SJP students of the same university just want to talk. Yeah, just just real brief um, to Maureen. I think there, there was there was a serious elaborate reference to COINTELPRO. I think a lot of the intelligence repression that we see against political dissident is based out of the American experience, um, and also the way they dodge human rights organizations. To your question, um, I'm definitely not an expert, but um, I know that Amir Haas has written a lot about the organ. Trafficking. She's a Haaretz correspondent. Um, she's the Haaretz correspondent, the only one that gives dignity to that organization. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's, I think, a giant how much which we're standing on. And um, so I would read about that. There was this crazy doctor who got arrested for organ harvest. I forget his name. In Jersey? Maybe? No, no, no. In Israel. In Israel, in Israel so. There yeah. the yeah. Over my head. And the ISIS troop thing. Um, I think it's pretty obvious to see that Israel sort of tiptoed to figure out what will happen in Syria and is trying to navigate ways to in, like, introduce their forces. And there were serious rumors that showed that they did grant um, sort of medical treatment to certain ISIS soldiers, while at the same time saying, why is everyone <coughs> talking about the occupation? Look at us on. Yeah, I, there is. There has been uh, Nancy Shepard's views actually from an anthropologist from UC Berkeley has actually written a lot, and she did uh, expose the organ donation, uh, not donation, organ harvesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, from uh, uh, that, that's going on in Israel now. How much of it is about Palestinian prisoners or former prisoners? We do not. There is not. There is a lot of discussion going on. We do know that the bodies of Palestinians will get captured. Captured. When in uh, militant operations, and then Israel holds them in something called number symmetry. So they are the numbers symmetry because they give a number to each body of bones, and they basically hold hostage the bones, the remains of people, and won't give them back to their families to raise. So somebody like Dalal Mughrabi, this well-known Palestinian combatant from 1978, who led a, a commando group on the beach of, uh, of Tel Aviv and was killed by Abu Barak by the former Israeli Prime Minister. He was seen in the picture, and he's the one who led the Mossad operation to assassinate many of the And he's coming leaders. back now as the big hope of <laughs> yeah. Zionist left. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah, 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 okay, yeah. But you know, there is, it's very weird. Things kind of like the whole relativity yeah. issue works very weird. Yeah. Very but anyway, so he, so 
the land who over his body is still born, are still being held. Then when there was an exchange between Hezbollah and Israel about some bodies of Israeli prisoners that were the bodies of the Israeli soldiers, they were supposed to release her body and her family was waiting to bury her. Mm -hmm. And then when they did the DNA, it turns out that it wasn't her body. And actually her mother died and got buried now in the Palestinian cemetery in Beirut. And she was never able to bury her daughter alive. So her bones are still being held. And this is cases for many, many. So there is a lot of this stuff going on. I mean, I think we have tons of horror stories that are going on. The question is, how do we go you know, beyond that? And yes, and ISIS is being, I mean, not only ISIS. People from uh, Syria and so on are being treated because Israel like always likes to present itself as the most democratic, most humane, in a sea of Arabs who are backward and ruthless and misogynist and bloodthirsty and DNA-born terrorists and so on. I mean, Israel loves to do that. This is, this is what Israel does all the time. And the people who are here in the propaganda, in the Israeli, pro Israeli or the US, I mean, they do this all the time. It's not just it's not just Palestinians who get presented that way. I actually do disagree with the Palestinian exception for free speech. Okay. And I've had multiple discussions with the Palestinian leader. I love them. They're actually defending me. <laughs> but I do, I do not think that there, that there is an exception. I think what is going on the difference between Palestine and other places is that we have a very strong pro-Israeli law, number one, that actually continues agitating around Israel's interests. But also, I think the history as well. The history that Israel and Zionism are presented as that Israel is a creation in response to the anti-Semitism, the pogroms, and the Holocaust. This is an equation that we really need to kind of like talk about and discuss and also say how Israel has used the Holocaust survivor and abused them and actually has also used Jewish history and has used a whole bunch of people in order to build a settler colonial project. And I think once we do that, then the whole question about it is not, I don't think, I don't see it as an exception because if we see what happens in McCarthyism, Palmer Reed, Emma Goldman, Every, the, the, the Japanese in the, in, during the, the Second World War, the history of indigenous people, coin to Black Panthers. I mean, you know, yes, I, I'm, I'm not minimizing what's happening to us, but I don't think what's happening to us is exceptional to what's happening to other people. So um, we had this conversation, so it's not like I'm saying something that we haven't said before. Okay. I'm sorry um, for, I think we're done. Um, and I apologize to those of you who haven't been able to ask questions. <laughs> Um, I would encourage you to sign up on the, the give us your name and email to be part of the ongoing discussion. DeadlyExchange.org. Check it out. Brilliant slide. Good research. Join the campaign. There's a lot of work to be done. Okay, so thank you to the panelists. And, uh, thank you for the uh, for the event. Oh.